Hi. Dark black. Black and crumbly. It looks like a, yeah. It is, it is effectively, it's gone back to being a, yeah. Yeah. So when you Well, some, some people actually get a, a big sieve and sieve it out, and the, the, the rough stuff that's still not broken down, they put into the next bin. But I, I, just, take a picture, I, I just take an ordinary um, spading fork, you know, the, the four-tined fork, and anything that's too sort of lumpy, I chuck over into, into the next bin. But, uh, yeah, and, and uh, grass is wonderful. But when you, if you take grass clippings from your, from your, gar from your lawn, don't put too thick a layer because it tends to get very um, compacted and they often go very slimy. So try not to use too much of that in any one layer. Layer it only about two inches deep and then put some soil or some peat or something else that's brown on top of that. There's, there's a lot to talk about compost. It, it would take all night. <laughs> We're already running a bit late. Compost teas. They're cheaper fertilizer from natural ingredients. So that's the nice thing about them, because fertilizer is getting more and more expensive. Ingredients are not always to hand, though, or available in big quantities. You don't want to go and buy a huge bag of alfalfa meal, because you're not going to necessarily use it. If you're going to do a five-gallon can at a time, you're going to use, it's going to take you about 10 years to use a bag of alfalfa meal. And by then, it might not be very nice. Anyway, storage, obviously, is a, is a space and the smell of some of the compost teas are a bit, yes. Has anybody started the alfalfa one yet? And <laughs> I warned you. <laughs> it has, it comes with a warning. <laughs> I don't know whether the little bags have, but I, I did put on the big bags. I put a, a, a thing which said, keep it in a lidded pail, because otherwise it'll stink. <laughs> anyway, so alfalfa tea. Um, yes, I had to laugh yesterday. I went down to pick up some peat um, at one of the shops. And uh, I said, what's the difference between this green bagged Progro and the ordinary sphagnum plain peat moss? And the guy looks at me and he says, well, he says, the really serious greenhouse guys buy the green one, but there are some other guys who do too. <laughs> I found this recipe actually <laughs> on a marijuana growing site. <laughs> but I did find it on several other sites. So I think the marijuana guys got it from somebody else. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I don't grow marijuana, please note. <laughs> anyway, alfalfa compost tea. Um, it does smell, I'll warn you, if you do actually start using this stuff. It is basically an, a, a high nitrogen source. You would use it as a dressing on things like peas, beans, um, well, all the, all the root, uh, non-root types. Onions are the only one that I would use it on that are root vegetables, basically, onions and garlic. Um, but it, anything that grows above the ground, use the alfalfa because it's nitrogen source but it does smell horribly. So you've got types of teas. You've got your fish or your kelp emulsions. It's unlikely that those sort of things you're gonna make yourself, because otherwise you'd have to go down to Black Harbor to one of the aquaculture crowds there, and get a whole lot of old fish bones and scales and whatever, and put it in a bin and, boy, do you think alfalfa smells? <laughs> Anybody ever wet your dulse and left it to, to rot? That doesn't smell too good either, I can tell you. Anyway, um, it's probably best to buy those already made and then dilute them because you dilute those mostly about one is to 40. So you know, they, they go a long way. Comfrey tea. Comfrey? Anybody grow comfrey? Good I'm stuff. Again the mm. Yeah, yeah. And it grows horribly easily, but it's, it's very prickly to handle. But its, um, it's Latin name is symphytum, and in the old days it was known as knit bone because it was used as a poultice when people broke their arms or their legs or their whatevers. Um, and they used it as a poultice, and they, they, they made it into an infusion and actually drank it. The British soldiers used a lot of it. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a most amazing curative 
herb. It's very, very easy to grow. It's also very good for bees. It's got a little blue and pink flower. It's not a particularly pretty plant. It grows up quite tall. And it's got big leaves, and, and it, it grows about that tall, and you've got to have quite a bit of space for it. But it is really, really good. You pick the leaves, put them in a bin with a lid. Again, it stinks. Um, put a whole lot of water with it. Draw off the water in about six weeks' time and use it as a nitrogen fertilizer tea. It is brilliant. It really is good. Uh, alfalfa tea, you can add whatever additives. This little pack that I do has with it boron, because we're very short of boron here in New Brunswick. It's got um, bone meal with it, and it's got um, magnesium, which is actually Epsom salts. Now, down in the tropics, you've got an absolute horrible lack of magnesium. So if you were growing things like papayas and uh, guavas, you know, things that you find in the shops here that are not particularly nice because they've traveled too far and they've been picked too soon, um, you just absolutely lace them with Epsom salts and everybody looks at you and thinks, what the heck are you buying great big packs of Epsom salts for? Have you got problems? <laughs> yeah, you've got problems, but they're soil ones. <laughs> Right, so, um, yeah, so you can add what you like, but when you mix this, um, I wouldn't use it, it, well, if you're going to use it now or now-ish, it takes about three or four weeks to, to come to full maturity, um, you can use it before you plant your transplants out if you want to, but it's used normally as a top dressing um, about every month when you're growing your vegetables onwards. So. I buy it direct from Veezy's. It's, it's from Veezy's. You can buy packs of it. You can buy a kilo at a time, yeah. But I should think you'd probably get it at the co-op. I've never tried, but I, I buy direct, yeah. But, it, you know, it's, it's, it, you use so little, because otherwise if you, if you use too much, if you use too much of any of these things, it's going to, again, go the wrong direction and you're going to burn your plants. Um, any of these teas use diluted. Don't use them just absolutely, you know. This, this you can use one, one is to four or one is to five on the dilution, especially on your seedlings because otherwise you are going to burn them. Nitrogen-based teas are good for leafy vegetables, not so good for root veg. So this is the alfalfa mix for the five gallons. Um, so if you're going to make it yourselves, you're going to use two cups of alfalfa meal or pellets, one tablespoon of magnesium, which is your um, Epsom salts, a quarter teaspoon of boron, that's, you know, that's as much as you need, and one teaspoon of calcium carbonate. Add the alfalfa to five gallons of water. Um, it's all on these, on these if, you, if you want. And then add the next three ingredients to it. Stir daily. Add one tablespoon of molasses every third day, and you can use just the ordinary black strap, right? Don't, don't go and get the fancy grade or anything like that. Um, it's, it's the sugar in it actually enhances all the others. And it's, it's a carbon, it's a source of carbon with it. Yeah. And boy, use diluted one is to five, but store it outside. It really, by the time you've got all the molasses in it, for about, I, I add four lots of molasses to it and then let it s steep for a couple of weeks after that. Oof, it really does not smell nice. <laughs> Yeah, it does, doesn't it? But I wouldn't, I wouldn't have anybody drinking it. <laughs> Where do you buy the calcium carbonate? Um, I've got a 20 kilo pack that I bought from Sodium. Sugar. Sodium. Yeah. And it's six, six dollars eighty-three a pack. So it's yeah. So that's that. Leaf mold. Now, some people say incorporate your leaf mold, your leaves, into your compost. I was taught by the RHS not to do that because they tend to break down rather slower than most of your organic material. So we were always taught to keep it separate. It's extremely rich and full of all the trace elements because after all, the trees have sucked all those trace elements and all that food up and put it into the leaves and of course, when those leaves die off, they're on the ground again. So, and most trees, unless you're really, really on pure rock, up at Plaster Rock or somewhere up there, they, they 
have got a lot of really good soil to, to build in. Um, it takes uh, probably about a year to really break down your leaf mold properly. So if you collected last fall's leaf leaves, if you've got them in plastic bags, they'll be ready for you for next fall, this, this coming fall. So that's the, the one con of it, and you need a lot of space, obviously. And some leaves are toxic to other plants. Black walnut. Don't go bring that anywhere near any plants, because it it'll stop them growing. It's, it's a growth inhibitor, actually, as such. Um, maple, you know, we've got wonderful maple trees here in the city, but until they are rotted, if you put fresh maple leaves on as a mulch over the winter, you're going to find that some of your growth is not going to be particularly good in the spring. So rather use them well and truly rotted. What about oak leaves? Oak takes forever to break down. Yeah. 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 They're very high in tannins too. Yeah. Um, they're not as bad. They are the same family, basically. They're the same genus, but apparently they're not as bad. Of course, they break down quite quickly, too. That's the nice thing about butternut leaf. The little stems don't break down as quickly, but the leaf itself does. Uh, watch out for fungal diseases, as I said before. If you've got those black tar spots on maple leaf, just be careful that you've really, really got it thoroughly broken down. And the other thing is that your calcium carbonate your lime, or your limestone, will actually nullify a lot of those fungal diseases. So when you're, you're making a leaf mold pile, put a lot of calcium into it, and it will nullify quite a lot of the fungal diseases. Watering. Now, I'm going mad. It's too dry. I can't <laughs> believe that it's so dry. But interestingly, I have a couple of patches where I put in peat moss last year, and a couple of patches where I didn't put in peat moss last year. And they're within 20 yards of each other. The ones that I put the peat moss into last year, I've been working happily. The ones that I didn't put the peat moss into are soggy. It's amazing. You need to water deeply. And I can't stress that enough. It's no good putting a tiny bit of water on a plant, because it's, all it's going to do is get those roots coming back up to the surface, and that's not going to do the plant any good, because it's not going to be able to get those trace elements and those minerals that it needs from the depth that you're, you're looking at. So, water only when necessary. Water immediately after transplanting, and when you're transplanting, don't forget to put some sugar in the water that you're going to use when you've transplanted. That carbon in the sugar helps your plant actually settle more easily into the ground, and they won't wilt as much. It helps them stay turgid, as it's called. It helps the actual the, the stems stay turgid. So um, the mix there is one tablespoon of sugar to one gallon of water. <laughs> 